maybe we can um, begin with two images. Uh, we'll see much more, but we didn't um, decide to use all of the images in the show or in the book, and we picked some we would like to comment and uh, discuss, because uh, parts of the conversation we had uh, is, um, sorry, part of the conversation we had is still uh, to be continued and we might also ask questions, further questions we didn't really uh, had answers about but make hypotheses. And this was part of the fun of the conversation that was serious too, but it was really a great, um, for us, a great meeting. So uh, that's it. See this works. Yeah. Um, so, Henri Cartier-Bresson and Helen Levitt's work uh, from Mexico was included in, in their first influential uh, exhibitions. Uh, for Cartier-Bresson, it was in 35 at Julian Levy's gallery. And for uh, Levitt, it was in 43 at MoMA. This is quite interesting because uh, the work was made really a um, little time before. But then uh, it was only shown on its own uh, much later twice in Paris for Cartier Bresson in uh, 84 and 95, with two catalogues uh, that maybe are still available for some of them. Uh, the first one not, but the second one might be. And uh, only once for Levitz, uh, in the US only, uh, in 97. So it means that for both, uh, it was shown quite uh, rapidly, but then there was a big gap, and it's, I think it's, uh, more um, likely to say for Levitt, it was under underestimated. For um, Cartier Bresson, certainly not so much, but for Levitt, yes, it was. Yeah, so this um, invitation to uh, think about, to converse about the Mexico work of Cartier Bresson and Helen Levitt uh, was, was of great interest to us because this kind of focus had not. Uh, been been uh, been uh, engaged with before between these two photographers who had been linked together uh, more than half a century ago. Um, uh, there's a quote downstairs in the exhibition, if you've had a chance to see it, uh, that comes from an article that James Sobey wrote called The uh, Art of the Poetic, Poetic Accident. And I think it's really one of the first uh, prominent um, essays to link the photographic ethos of Cartier-Bresson and Helen Levitt. That was 1943. So um, I think this exhibition, this, this, this talk uh, tonight, is really the first opportunity to, to consider the work, the Mexican work of Cartier-Bresson and Levitt. Uh, Cartier-Bresson, of course, spent nine months in Mexico uh, from 1934, 1935. Helen Levitt, we think, spent five months in Mexico City in 1941. Um, and on the surface, there's, um, if we look at where each photographer was uh, in their lives, in their, um, in their sort of arcs, career arcs as artists, um, there's a lot of similarities. So uh, on the surface, again, they both were using a Leica camera. Uh, they were both in the latter half of their 30s, so, so quite young, so kind of in the beginning of their work, but both of them had, by the time they made it to Mexico, made uh, some very important images that we still esteem today. Um, although neither of them, at the time of their trip to Mexico, had really been all that well known um, to the larger art or photographic community. So it was a really kind of a, Mexico I think became a kind of Exploration, of course, but also a proving ground for them, uh, for themselves as, as artists. So I think it's interesting to ask the question of, you know, what can we learn from looking, looking again at the Mexican work of Carter Brisson and Helen Levitt through the, the lens of, of each other and, and their lives? And their connection. And their connection. Okay, so we uh, decided to uh, begin with this picture that you might know um, because it's one of the most beautiful and famous of Cartier-Bresson's during his um, uh, stay in, uh, in Mexico. And this is uh, also part of the collection of the Fondation Cartier-Bresson, of course, because um, uh, it was um, so it 
it, one of the prints has been given uh, to Ellen Levitz by um, Cartier-Bresson uh, in 35. It was signed in 41. And you get, can see um, uh, downstairs that uh, the back of the picture so has been uh, written by Cartier-Bresson. But we don't know uh, today if the print was given to Helen Levitz so in um, uh, 33, uh, sorry, 35, um, before or after the show. And this uh, is still in debate because uh, she spoke of it, uh, but uh, we only have her um, indirect witness, um, sorry, testimony. And we don't know exactly when she got it. So it's possible that she saw uh, the Julian Levy show and picked this and asked uh, Cartier Bresson to print this image uh, for her and to give it to her, or uh, he decided to give it to her on his uh, own um, uh, taste and decision. Um, so this uh, picture of the newspaper vendors was given uh, to Levitt in 35, only months after it has been, it has been done in, uh, in Mexico. During his first visit to New York, because he had had a show in New York uh, before, but um, the Julian Levy uh, show on, in 35 was his first show, Cartier Bresson being present. And uh, it's at this moment that he met with uh, Helen Levitt. We don't know exactly how and when. Uh, it was in, um, they, in fact, um, became acquainted uh, in another context uh, in, um, in a meeting with other uh, photographers and, and filmmakers, but uh, they had a friendship uh, beginning from then on and which lasted until the 80s uh, or even later. And um, yeah, their first meeting was the occasion of discussing the Mexican prints, Mexican images, and for Levitt it was uh, of course, receiving this gift, but also make, maybe making the decision to go to Mexico. She said, I, if I hadn't met with Cartier-Bresson and seen his prints, I wouldn't have gone there, because I'm not such a mm. traveler. Yeah, and I think it's um, also interesting to think about this particular object in the, uh, in the sort of Helen Levitt lore. So the story in the Helen Levitt biography is that she sees the exhibition she decides, you know, she had been flirting with the idea of um, becoming a photographer, but she was also very, inter very much interested in, in film, as Dr. Brisson was. And so when she receives this print, she's not yet a photographer. She only becomes a photographer, decides on a life in photography after seeing Dr. Brisson's work, after getting this, uh, receiving this, this print, and after spending some time uh, with him while he's in New York for almost a year in 1935. Of course, the meeting of Levitz with uh, Wolf Evans also counted. Yes. Uh, I'm here to mention it. <laughs> okay, maybe we can go on. So, this so one's for you. Yeah, so um, we found in our, in a sort of researching, um, uh, trying to find any sort of shred of evidence, of artifacts, of uh, their respective times in, in Mexico. Uh, we thought these told a kind of story of the difference of their the experience that Cartier-Bresson and Levitt had in Mexico. So on the left you have, uh, uh, the left, right, you have uh, standing a, a picture of um, Manuel Alvarez Bravo in the hat, and seated is uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson. And this is a picture taken on the occasion of a joint exhibition they had at the Palacio de Bellas Artes in Mexico City. Um, I think they m met, uh, Alvarez Bravo and Cartier-Bresson met on the occasion of the exhibition, became uh, uh, friends. Of course, their work had quite a lot in common um, before they, they knew each other. and. Um, you know, Cartier Brisson really, in his time in Mexico, he he had the time of his life. Um, he was living with friends. He was living very cheaply. He he, he tried to become really a, a Mexican. He tried to lose himself in in, in the time there. Um, and of course, if you know Cartier Brisson's story, uh, you know it's the story of a 
of someone who is a, um, a peripatetic a wanderer. You know, he's he is this this wanderlust. He needs to be um, stimulated um, in the places where he he is, and um, and you know, without much of a plan. So I think when he uh, arrived in Mexico, right? It was first in the context of a um, of a, a large um, expedition um, to uh, investigate the possibility of Pan um, American uh, 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 thoroughfare, and the funding for that project quickly fell apart, and most of the collaborators who had been brought together uh, sort of went home dejected. Cartier-Bresson thought, this is great, I'm here, I'm gonna stay, and he had no plan to leave. So um, uh, he lived a very full life, um, including a very active nightlife. Helen Levitt, on the other hand, uh, lived a very solitary uh, life in Mexico City. She goes to Mexico first, really on the coattails of um, his friend, uh, James Agee's dissolving marriage with his then wife Alma Agee, and uh, she decides that in order to sort of clear her mind uh, and and really create a break in their their marriage, marriage she's going to take her and her one year old son uh, to Mexico City, and Helen decides to to go along with her. And soon after um, they arrive in Mexico City, uh, Alma finds and falls in love with uh, another man and pretty much abandons Helen to her own devices and held, Helen's by herself in, in Mexico City, does not speak Spanish. Um, it's not known what kind of company she kept. We think she kept pretty much to herself. And the only scrap of evidence we have is this letter that's in the Helen Levitt archives. It's a letter, um, and we think she wrote quite a lot of letters when she was in, in Mexico City back home to, to friends. And so this is a, a letter written to her close friend, Jan, Janice Loeb, who was uh, um, a, someone involved with film. She was a researcher also at MoMA. Um, they would go on to make uh, projects together, um, most notably the film In the Street, um, filmed in the late 40s with, with uh, James Agee. And, and uh, she writes quite a lot about um, her time uh, in, this, in this letter, quite, quite, quite revealing. But it's the only scrap of evidence besides her photographs of her time in Mexico. And the list, but that, that, that comes later. Uh, just one thing about this uh, is that it, it's quite funny to notice that they don't seem, um, Alvaz Bravo and Cathy Bresson don't seem to enjoy themselves so much <laughs> in the picture. But I think he did really much more than he looks like. Then we picked two pictures by uh, Henri Cathy Bresson that uh, Helen Levitt um, probably see so in the show, documentary and anti-graphic uh, photograph from Cathy Bresson, Walker Evans, and Alvarez Bravo at the Julian Levy Gallery, so from April 23rd to May 7 uh, in 35 in New York. Uh, so it was uh, Cathy Bresson's second show at Julian Levy, and but the first one he attended, uh, he, he was uh, in New York for the first time. And um, so we know that the prints, the photograph he took in, uh, in Mexico were printed for some of them there because he published some in the local press and made a living part from this. But then uh, there is no catalog from the documentary and anti-graphic photographs uh, by and so on. Uh, but in, uh, so it was in uh, 2000, uh, the show here, I don't remember, sorry. Seven. Um, the Fondation Cartier-Bresson and Agnesier uh, tried to um, um, recount this uh, exhibition and make, made a catalog, but there was no list, uh, checklist of the exhibition, so it's part guess. But these pictures were in there. There were also, the, the one of you on your uh, left, was also in the Palacio de Bellas Artes exhibition in Mexico uh, from um, so, um, the show with uh, Alvaz Bravo and Cartier Bresson. It was, uh, in fact, in the invita invitation card. Um, those two pictures so came from Mexico, were on show in, uh, in New York, and Levitt very probably saw them. They also express um, the, um, the mood of Cartier-Bresson's uh, um, stay. Um, for the left part, it's, it expresses um, the 
contentment. He also expressed saying it was the best time of his life. Um, he had he was surrounded by friends there, and he also had um, a close attention to the way women were um, um, behaving with children and the warmth and love he felt around. And this image on your left is expressing that, of course, very directly. And it's quite unusual from him at this period of time to consider he would deliver such an image. So um, in Rushitan, not in Mexico, he went uh, to, to stay in the, in the countryside. Um, he photographed women and children together uh, as, as family pictures uh, as to convey this feeling of warmth and affection uh, he experienced among them. But also he would, in uh, Mexico, uh, photograph destitutes in the street, like the one on the right, which reminds us of pictures he would have taken, in, for example, in Marseille in 32, so before he went to uh, Mexico. So in a way, the second one on your right echoes something uh, from before, as the one of your left, on your left would be something quite new in his work. Uh. Uh, Cartier Bresson also took a third type of picture during his time in Mexico that's exemplified by this very well-known image in which he had uh, friends and associates of his, his. In this case, this was one of his roommates at the time, uh, the painter uh, Nacho Aguirre, uh, sort of set up in a situation to create this uh, surrealist uh, composition. Um, and I think what's... Um, interesting when looking at Cartier Bresson's work in Mexico City, of course there are very strong strains of the surrealist um, uh, ethos that he had really immersed himself in in the years before going to, to Mexico. But there's also um, those pictures that we just saw before. Uh, of course on the left you had a picture of a sleeper, which is a kind of uh, very, uh, very typical surrealist um, trope. But uh, the, the ones on the, uh, the many pictures like the ones on the right, which are just these, as Anne said, I think you know, you're, these pictures of, of, of harmony, of, of contentment, showing a kind of joie de vivre of, 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 uh, uh, of, that's reflective, I think, of his, of his time there. Um, I think that. Also, those videos too um, about children and girls. Yeah, yeah. So I think so. The, these pictures also uh, express um, something you know similar to that contentment. These p pictures of of young young children of of girls. And again, you know, there's not a single strain of of, of surrealism in, in in these pictures. Uh, and I think that uh, some of the pictures. Um, I think, get back to his own inspiration to become a photographer, which is that, that very famous picture by um, the Hungarian photographer Martin Munkacsi of the three African boys sort of uh, just seeing their backs, but they're running towards uh, uh, a, a sea, and it's just this incredible ecstatic moment that uh, captured everything. And it's, it's one of the few prints that Carter Bresson uh, kept in his house uh, un until, until his death. I don't know, uh, Clément might uh, help us on this, uh, if he photographed children so much uh, before, and what, how they would like uh, compared to this, uh, these images, uh, because uh, we thought it might express something very special of his uh, stay in Mexico, and uh, of also of the fact that he was staying with friends in Mexico, or Rujitan, and the children um, were part of this very happy life he had there. He really expressed it this way, saying to uh, Pierre Asselin, uh, it was the happiest moment in his life. Um, so this is, uh, sorry, 36, 38. This is um, one of the first picture, an early picture from Levitt not only of children, uh, you know of them because she also was exhibit, uh, exhibited in the Fondation Cartier-Bresson and uh, luckily because it, we don't see her so much. But this one is, uh, is a picture of a destitute in New York 
like in 36, uh, 38, of course, uh, many photographers of the time, from the time, would have um, uh, picked, uh, sorry, made such a picture. But uh, for Levitt, it's quite atypical. But you can really link this one to um, Cathy Bresson's Form 1 of a Sleeper. The thing is also, Levitt would show him his face down, not his face up. And you can wonder about the uh, politic or poetic kind of image they produce. So here's one of Helen Levitt's uh, pictures from Mexico City. Um, when Helen arrived in Mexico, Mexico uh, the first uh, landing point was in Veracruz. And, and there she tried to find um, something close to that energy and the spirit that she had found in Spanish Harlem in New York um, in the, the run of pictures she made in the late 30s uh, and early 40s up until her trip to, to Mexico City and didn't find it. Uh, she found instead a kind of ritualized um, gesture and behavior of the kids on the, uh, in, in public places. And that this really um, uh, clued her into the fact that this is going to be a very different environment, not one that she was used to, not one that uh, one that was going to be perhaps a struggle, more of a struggle to identify with uh, and to work in. And so uh, Levitt, like Cartier-Bresson, did not speak Spanish, but because she kept to herself, I think um, it also isolated her uh, and perhaps helped her attune her other senses, especially the, the sort of visual sense, to other th things going on uh, in, in, in the scenes in, in Mexico she was observing. So I th we, we uh, uh, Anne began the talk saying that um, Helen Levitt's Mexico work was shown in an exhibition in the late 90s in the, Uni in the United States, and I think has largely been um, overlooked by um, uh, curators and scholars working on Helen Levitt because they're different than the work that we, we know and love. There, there is uh, less of a sense of that sort of, that magical uh, realism that she's so uh, associated with. They're, they're more gr her work in Mexico City was more, is more grim, um, perhaps more bleak. And this is a picture that I think uh, exemplifies that. This is a, yes, it's a picture of a, a, a young girl smiling, but she's smiling holding a dead rabbit. Uh, we can also um, link this one to the former one of the little girl uh, smiling. She's nude, she's uh, playing with boys. Uh, you can see the pictures from uh, Cartier Bresson uh, downstairs. Um, this one, um, it's a different kind of spontaneity uh, in, in both cases, in fact. Yeah. And um, also, there are two versions of this uh, image. Uh, the other one, she's not uh, really smiling, and the expression is more undecided. And this one was uh, picked uh, by MoMA in the 43 exhibition. It was part of it. And it's probably a very, um, yes, telling image more than the other one, um, because of the contrast of the expression and also the uh, drama of the dead rabbit uh, that might also like, uh, look like, a, like um, um, a toy, in fact. It's, mm. uh, it, it might not be a real rabbit, but it is. And uh, I guess, of course, Levitz uh, experienced the Depression in New York, which was, of course, hard times. But when she came to uh, Mexico, um, the um, conditions were not the same at all, because, of course, people in Mexico were very poor, but also um, the situation was... Um, not the same tension as in New York during the war. So it's it's a mix of uh, different feelings and also of a very different situation because she was not a local, of course, in Mexico, and she wasn't in touch with the locals at all. So it's it's an expression of very different things in this image, and in a way it um, summarizes her feeling mm. at this moment. I, I think what this picture also uh, speaks of is uh, what she did find in common uh, between her experience in Mexico and her experience in New York City, which is really seeing the world around her as a kind of stage. 
and to observe the actions and the gestures and the interactions of people uh, on that stage. And, and part of that stage, a really important part, is the atmosphere, the environment. In this case, it's this cracked pavement, it's the, the dirt, the wear. Uh, later on, we'll see pictures of uh, kind of the erosion of, of, of buildings, peeling paint, um, a kind of forlorn quality that um, has something in common with the um, the, uh, the the stoops and the the building um, facades that she that were the backdrops of her pictures in in Yorkville and also in the East Village in, in New York and and so it also uh, speaks to her 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 very directed interest in working class subjects in regular people uh, in the downtrodden but perhaps with some kind of redeeming quality about them. She, I think she cared very much about the lives of these, of these people, the individual people she photographed. Maybe some parenthesis about um, the, uh, so the, the sensibilities with the environment. Uh, you said that when uh, Cartier Bresson stayed in New York for a year in 35, uh, Levitt accompanied him to when he was making photographs in Brooklyn, and we know only few of them. And in fact, he was um, uh, there to study cinema. So it's not uh, so surprising that uh, there were few photographs from this stay. There are lit some, some photographs with boys playing with guns uh, in Yorkville. But uh, we know very few of them. And the question we ask uh, ourselves is also that Levitt seems not to have taken pictures when she was accompanying him in Brooklyn, for example. But then. Uh, we were discussing this together, and I said, what's so surprising in the fact that Levitt, who was considering Cartier Bresson was a genius, wouldn't have taken pictures when she was accompanying him to Brooklyn, because it was so impressive to her. I mean, it, it would be surprising that she did take picture, and she didn't, in fact. So this is... Um, maybe an expression of her ability to, um, to um, um, go further um, on her own, of course. Mm. And also, she was, I think, uh, in Mexico, she was uh, confronted to um, um, being abroad, being on her own, and also being a photographer for the first time in such conditions. Uh, not in her environment, but in, in a not very um, um, difficult, but um, a foreign environment. Then we consider this picture by Cartier-Bresson, uh, which is interesting uh, for different reasons. But um, of course, one of the reasons were why um, Cartier-Bresson and Levitt were interested in going to Mexico was because it was a country of revolution, because it was a country of um, uh, Que Viva Mexico, of this big picture project, uh, film project, um, of course, by uh, Eisenstein, uh, which didn't uh, happen uh, wasn't completed uh, before, long after that. But uh, so Cartier-Bresson was uh, drawn to Mexico as many other intellectuals uh, from France and other countries because it was, a, it was a country of revolution. Then this image, I was wondering if it wasn't the single one to express this because one might wonder if his images of destitutes in Mexico are political images. I, I'm not so sure, because he was, of course, a leftist at this moment. He was to be engaged, involved in politics, but after his coming back to Europe and France, uh, in, in, in the States he was studying cinema and he was involved, but not expressing himself as, as um, uh, involved in politics. It, it didn't express itself yet. And uh, this image for me shows, maybe you, you disagree with that or you, you would <laughs> process, um, but this image expresses maybe a nostalgia of revolution and also it's connected to an image, we could go there maybe back and forth, yeah. I think. This image is the single one with the Munkasi's uh, image we mentioned before. He would keep all his life long. It was, we don't know when he got it, 
and it's an image of Fortino Samano, who was one of Zapata's lieutenants, um, minutes before his death. And Cartier-Bresson would keep his, this print uh, all his life long in his studio with the Munkaxi uh, image. So two images, very significant uh, for him. And so for me, it's quite impossible to not to connect the Fortino Samano portrait by, by uh, Casasola with not to connect this image with this one. Because this man seems to be mourning uh, on, an in on an execution place. And uh, it's, it's a pla place of meditation and nostalgia for revolution, maybe. So uh, when Cartier-Bresson photographs uh, sleepers uh, on the street, um, they tend not to be um, just bleak. Uh, there's usually something that is a human human uh, quality or a um, something redeeming. And I think in, in, in this case, we have a picture of a, a man and a woman on the street. There's, there, there's something tender about the way that they're entwined. And I think we see this even more transparently in the picture that he gave to, uh, to Levitt of these uh, new sellers. And I think that, you know, he, you know, Cartier-Bresson really went through his life, especially this time as a photographer, as a, as a kind of exile and, and as a kind of um, uh, outsider, uh, uh, really wanting to observe and, and not really wanting to get, get, you know, get, to get too involved with this, with this subject. Um, I think that there was something obviously very poignant uh, in the in the composition, I mean, it's very very poignant in the in the human um, uh, shapes and the forms and the way that they're entwined. But it's also something very um, uh, 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 there's an interest in, in the formal qualities of the of the picture as well, the geometry of the of the composition that he had learned earlier in his training as a painter. Can you get back to this one, please? Yeah. I just uh, um, wanted to mention the fact that the sleepers. These are not, they are maybe destitutes, maybe beggars, but maybe just sleepers in the hottest hours of the day. We don't know, in fact, uh, what they mean. Uh, we don't know about their sleep. We don't know if they, are, they don't have a, a place to stay or if they are just napping. Of course, they are not rich people, of course, yes. But we really, there, there is a mystery about them, and that's the reason why. The, there is something uh, wandering between politics and poetics uh, that is unresolved. So um, the former picture with the newspaper vendors was very soft and very, um, um, I know, um, there is a gesture um, but also something very quiet in it, the opposite of this one, of course, which is much more Levitz-like uh, than the ones we saw before. Levitt is already interested in people interacting in the public space. Uh, of course, you know, if you know of her, that she would never trespass, she would never go further thresho the threshold of a place. We don't know, but maybe one, but more, I think, mm -hmm. one picture of a boy inside a house, um, her pictures are taken outside, on the stoops, in the streets, uh, but not inside. She wouldn't uh, interfere, she wouldn't intrude, she wouldn't uh, trespass. So this image is one of the most famous for good reasons. It was also included in the 43 uh, exhibition at MoMA, which was um, Levitt's first exhibition of children. Uh, the, the theme uh, of the exhibition was this one. And in this case, uh, what is quite interesting is that the boys are fighting um, in an environment which is very common because it's a, it's a public place uh, called um, La Merced, which is a place of a market space, but it's also 
a building famous because it's called the Convent of La Merced, um, but was, that was photographed by Desiree Charnet, a French photographer, in, uh, fift, uh, in 1858. Uh, there are pictures by Desiree Charnet. I doubt Levitt saw them. Mm -hmm. But in this case, in this picture, it's just a background for the fight uh, of the boys. I think it's one of the few pictures Levitt took where the where the setting of the picture is actually uh, recognizable. Uh, it's kind of a, a well, a Takubaya landmark. is too, but yeah, but but less in, in terms of like a, a kind of a cultural yeah. uh, landmark. But this is uh, is in a way quite uh, atypical from from Levitt, right? Because uh, well, typical of her work, but atypical of her pictures in Mexico. Yeah. Yeah. So um, these are also typical pictures that Levitt took in, 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 in Mexico. Um, so I think what's kind of striking when you look at the pictures downstairs by Levitt is that unlike the work that she's so well known for of children um, playing, fighting, uh, interacting on the streets of Yorkville, um, in, in this work, the adults are the protagonists in Mexico. So Again, for the first time, really Almost. for the first time yeah. as, as, as the primary protagonist. And so, again, think about the fact that Levitt was alone. She had been abandoned by the, per the person that she came to Mexico City with. Um, she didn't understand the language, right? And so she's being attuned to um, smaller things, um, to gestures, to interactions, to quieter moments. And and again, Levitt like Cartier-Bresson, before they became photographers, they were very steeped in um, cinema and film, silent film. And it's almost as if she's looking for stills, she's making stills in this sort of silent film. Um, you know, uh, she was there for, uh, I think, four of the five months, uh, Mexico alone. She's looking, again, very carefully at gestures, facial expressions, um, and, and if you think about her as later association, um, or actually earlier than, right before she, she goes to Mexico City, uh, Mexico, she uh, begins a close association with, with James Agee, and you think about Agee's writing, his kind of uh, ecstatic uh, description. I think she's, um, what she's, one of the things she takes from Agee is this idea that there is a narrative meaning in, in, in gesture, in the telling gesture. And I think she's sort of enacting that here with pictures like this. One of the uh, elements that interested us both to, uh, in, in Levitt's case, is um, her interest in movement. Uh, she's waiting uh, for the right moment to capture, in this case, a kind of a pas de deux uh, between those two people. Uh, you have so the strip of uh, uncut uh, roll film um, um, so, um, uh, up, and then the image she um, picked uh, in this series of images. Uh, you can see it downstairs, of course, but it's um, it's the one. But on the other hand, the sequence is something that interests her and that will interest her in her film attempt uh, in the yeah. streets with uh, Ag and and, uh, and Jane Slab. So she's waiting for the right moment to capture this pas de deux, this animated expression of love between a man and a woman. Um, and in this case, it's more of a theatrical uh, um, expression than in the former images. But uh, it's very powerful and very, it's, it's also one maybe of her happiest moments. Mm -hmm. I think this one. Mm -hmm. uh, it was quite exciting to to do uh, research on Levitt's time in Mexico when we found the, the letter that she wrote to Janice Loeb in the archive. Uh, we were also able to um, look at the actual negatives, uh, in some cases, uh, from the time in Mexico City. And what was very um, telling is that um, Helen rarely cut her film into strips like photographers um, usually, usually do. And so really there's no contact sheets, uh, very few contact sheets of Levitt's archive. So in, if you think about the, the sort of the history of the Leica and the time that 
they're using it, that Cartier Brisson's using it. I mean, uh, when Cartier Brisson brings his Leica to Mexico in 34, there's probably very few Leicas um, or very few photographers using Leicas in, in Mexico City. And, and probably not so many more by the time Helen Levitt goes to Mexico in 1941. So uh, just underscoring the sense of like her thinking almost filmically um, about her time uh, and experience in, in Mexico City. Yeah, and also remind us that, uh, that she didn't see what she, the images she took, they were printed right. afterwards, right. which is quite interesting because she spent five months there and didn't see the prints. Yeah. There's, there's, exist. there's an interesting line in that letter that I, I showed before where she says to Janice, oh, well, you know, it'd be fun to sort of, you know, maybe I can appeal to um, Alvarez Bravo or, or his friend to see if I can uh, use their darkroom to, s to see the pictures, uh, to, s to, to develop the film and, and see some pictures. But uh, as far as we know, she never made that contact. Um, I'm not even sure she ever met Manuel Alvarez Bravo. We, we don't know. We don't know. Um, surely she saw his work in the Julian Levy show, and I'm sure that some of that was in her mind as she was working, but she really is her own person, her own artist here. It's yours. Yeah, so I think, uh, again, uh, with Cartier-Bresson, um, the, the strain of his work, in, in the surrealist strain of his work in uh, in, in Mexico is, uh, is, is apparent in many pictures, such as this, um, uh, found objects with you know, sort of repeated suggestive forms, strange, headless, uh, zoomorphic shapes, uh, objects that are wrapped, um, in, in this case, bloated with an unknown substance. They could be wineskins, I'm not quite sure. Um, and you know, if you think about surrealism in Mexico, um, you know, Breton does not go to Mexico until later. Uh, of course, there are strains of surrealism that come before through, through the painters. But, you know, Cartier-Bresson's time in Mexico, 34, 35, is really quite an early uh, projection of that or a, a kind of seeking of um, surrealism in the world uh, in, in Mexico by someone who was associated with that circle. Um, we discussed also the fact that um, so Levitt uh, wasn't interested in, in objects uh, the same way um, Cartier-Bresson would have been, was would have been, and also uh, for the previous um, image she wouldn't have taken such an image. But then when you see this one, this new one, uh, it might be considered as um, her only maybe attempt to be on the, the same uh, um, level of uh, playing with the uh, enigma uh, of, uh, of um, sh it's in a way one of her most surrealistic, surrealistic pictures. Because again, we don't know uh, what this man is doing there. And she was interested by this mystery. She also was interested by this, the way he was um, uh, leaning on those, um, on those uh, um, tombstones. And uh, again, we don't know what's happening there. And it's quite unusual from her. Yeah. So this might be one of the most close to Cartier Bresson's. Yeah. Events. I mean, I think this is could be uh, Helen's version of a of a sleeper, <laughs> done her way. Uh, so again, the picture uh, is a this is a, a pairing of uh, a Levitt and uh, Cartier Bresson. I think, in a way, uh, you could interchange the captions, and it, it could be plausible. Uh, maybe not so much uh, but the Helen Levitt side, but yeah. it, you could, um, it, it's quite plausible if, uh, to think that Cartier Brisson might have taken the picture on the, on the, on the right. That the reverse isn't so The, the sure. reverse is not true, yeah, I, I stand corrected. But you know, it's, a ver it's a also a very unusual picture by Levitt in Mexico of a, a woman completely, I think it's a woman, completely wrapped, completely obscured by this, uh, these, these cloths. Um, the figure is sleeping or resting on a pile of things, objects, garments perhaps, that are, that are wrapped. Um, and next to the head is this very suggestive uh, shape of an empty, empty, empty box. Well, there is an echo uh, in a picture that is downstairs uh, with this ghostly form uh, in Takubaya in this uh, so landscape. 
um, that is also um, undecipherable. You, you don't know who it is, but possibly a man, possibly a woman. And uh, it's, yes, quite unusual that Levitt doesn't show the face of the people she, pho she photographs. Mm -hmm. um, this is probably one of Levitt's most complex compositions um, or picture of humans' complex relationships, both, in fact. We have a portrait uh, of this, um, this man um, facing her, and, and the expression is quite different, uh, which is downstairs in the show and in the catalogue, of course. But here she shows the same man with really a, a play of the uh, looks of the little girl doesn't believe what she's seeing. This man with the tortillas uh, um, has really an, ex an incredible ex expression. And then you have the, the boy on the um, uh, first um, uh, level uh, with the finger in the nose. He doesn't care about what's around. So she's interested in interactions and also uh, in visual um, um, relations uh, between the people. Um, and in this fact, the drunk man, uh, she says in the letter, I think, he was shouting at her. Uh, she photographs him, so alone, uh, facing her. And here, she's interested in the children as much as in this bum with spot tortillas, the girl worrying and the boy uh, uh, smiling. Both of them, uh, so the three of them, interest her, but also what's happening in between them and she's facing them, what is quite interesting because we wondered if she, we think she probably used a right angle uh, viewfinder like Evans did. So it was a way to photograph people without being noticed as a photographer, or not so much. And in this case, you can really wonder how she could capture this moment. And also, in a way, if you think about Cartier-Bresson's pictures just, uh, in Mexico, just isolating his, his Mexican work, uh, this picture, which is also fairly well known, also becomes kind of uh, an exception um, in that this, um, this woman uh, is walking towards him. No doubt she sees him, although she's not looking at him. Uh, there, she's holding uh, an infant, sort of swaddled in this dark translucent cloth. Uh, there is a there is a sense of um, in, if you look at the, the severity of her expression, her angular face, this kind of stern demeanor. Uh, it's a it's a picture that stands out, I think, in its um, in as perhaps an allegory of death. Um, there's something otherworldly about the this mother and child, but also something a little exceptional about the 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 second child that's in the lower uh, left hand corner yeah, of the picture. Yeah, we, we joked about it because uh, I, I um, proposed that it, uh, the child, this, the girl, could come from a Levitt's pictures. And also, she, uh, the former one, doesn't look uh, like other women photographed by Cartier Bresson, yeah. of course, especially with the prostitutes, beautiful pictures of the prostitutes uh, he would uh, do there. Also with the mother's pictures, she, this one is, is a mother too, which is very atypical from uh, Cartier Bresson. Yeah. Okay, so about atypical, coming back to it. Um, Levitt uh, is known for her uh, urban uh, images from New York, but she really very rarely photographs something else uh, than the streets. And this picture, th there is a rare picture I love very much of um, uh, gypsies in Central Park, but it's a very early one and mm -hmm. not very well known. But this is uncommon from her because, so she went, uh, Cartier Bresson didn't, but she went to the suburbs of Mexico uh, in a place called Tacubaya, very poor one, with uh, sand mines. And this is not a cave really, but it's part of the sand mine. And this image of a girl in a landscape, a natural landscape, is completely unusual from her. You know better than me because you're the specialist on Levitt, but uh, I was interested in, in this image, which is undateable in a way. It could have been taken, I don't know, uh, 20 years later, 
and uh, or even more. And uh, it's an expression of loneliness that is really telling, um, really direct, and uh, it might echo the feeling she had. Mm. Uh, Levitz. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, you know these sand mines, this phenomenon of these families, these children uh, living in the sand mines was 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 fairly well known um, uh, in the in the sort of local um, uh, you know papers. There was articles about there was there was other photographs made by other photographers um, depicting these living situations as kind of squalid, um, as this kind of tr tragic situation. I think Levitt in this picture sees it as um, Someone's home. I mean, it's a it's a it's a child sort of playing in this in this kind well, of it's world. Her habitat. It's her habitat. Um, and these are also pictures taken in uh, the suburb of Mexico City, Tacubaya. Um, in this case, sort of underscoring the way she worked and the way she looked and the sort of filmic way she was composing her work. I think there are three of the four pictures uh, as prints. Uh, downstairs, um, and this, these pictures and the sequence of them uh, foretells the work that she would later do with Janet, Janice Loeb and James Agee uh, in the film On the Street. I, I just mentioned that In the Street is uh, fortunately available on the internet. Uh, of course, the quality is not the best you can find, but it's available and it's really worth it. If you never saw it before, please do that. Uh, and you know, I think it's also telling uh, of of a Levitt picture that you, in in these pictures, I think they're in a way they're close as well to her work in New York, and that you're more focused on the play, the ecstatic forms of these children interacting than you are on their squalor, on their on their on their conditions of living. Yeah, it's it's a more it's not a balance. She's definitely going on the uh, children's uh, side in their play. Yes. And it's close to um, a picture uh, Walker Evans picked from Levitt from uh, a book uh, like a pantheon of his best uh, loved photographers. And he picked a picture by Levitt of uh, boys uh, playing on a, on, a, on a vacant lot uh, that is close in a way uh, to mm -hmm. um, this one. Um, then we come to the most maybe famous with the uh, Nacho Aguirre uh, uh, picture you, you um, put downstairs. The most famous maybe is this Araignée d'Amour in French by Cartier-Bresson uh, taken. Uh, it's, it's a case for a um, decisive moment, of course, and surrealist expression. It's really um, um so fortunate because he uh, recalls he um, suddenly a door opened and he could see that and he knew it was he had to photograph it of course it was two women uh, making love something with a uh, very charge of sensuality and he of course uh, jumped on it <laughs> um, so decisive moment even if the expression comes later on of course surrealistic uh, expression of course too and uh, it's in a way the um, it go further than his famous pictures of uh, prostitutes I mentioned before. These pictures of prostitutes, we don't have uh, them downstairs. We have a few in the, in the uh, catalog. Uh, they recall the ones he took in uh, Sevilla in Spain, in 33, just so before he came to Mexico. And maybe even, uh, I didn't mention it so much uh, until now, but, now, but um, Levitt also saw not only, uh, of course, Cartier-Bresson, but also um, other photographers from this show at Julian, Julian Levy, and Walk Evans's pictures from Cuba. He, she was aware of that. And um, Cartier-Bresson in Cuba also photographed prostitutes close to uh, Cartier-Bresson's images from Sevilla and, and from Mexico. That was really something. But uh, as Agnes uh, recalled, uh, Levitt thought that um, Evans was so talented, but Cartier-Bresson was a genius. So uh, we chose this as one of the last slides because we th also thought that this was exemplary of a picture that Levitt would never make, could never make, because she never um, would never dare of intruding on a situa situation like this. And had she intruded, she would never take a picture. Um, more typical of her work in Mexico City is this picture, which is 
strange for Helen Levitt. Strange in that you have um, the subject looking directly at her. Uh, I think in this case, she's probably not using the right angle finder. Uh, we know from looking at the negative strip this picture is associated with that she had earlier noticed this woman um, going through the market with holding these birds, uh, also with holding a large satchel and a basket. And she Levitt proceeded to follow her as she made her way through the market. And um, she chose the middle exposure to, to print in which this very moment in which the woman looks at her, in which the birds that she's holding are, are sort of visible in, in relief because of their dark background. Uh, also the sort of outstretched wings which echo the flowing uh, sort of draped uh, fabric that um, the woman holds around her, or ties around her neck to hold the, the large satchel. Uh, it's a picture that shows, a, it's a scene of a kind of stark uh, socioeconomic reality, but we're transported by this, this, these details of a kind of unexpected grace, um, although it's, it's very understated. There's a, in a way, there's a, in Levitt's work, there's a lack of the kind of magical drama that you find often in, in Katya Prasan's work. Uh, it's a picture that I think is more true to her experience of this place and perhaps more experience to the, uh, more true to the experience of the place now. Um, there's a, there is a kind of timeless uh, quality about both Katya Prasan's and Levitt's work in Mexico City, the timeless in, 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 in different ways. Okay, I, I just also considered that this image from Levitt uh, would announce her work to come. Uh, she seems to be herself uh, in this image uh, already at ease, as she will be in New York City for ne the next decades until the very early uh, 80s or even beginning of the 90s because she uh, went on photographing. So the um, very last uh, slides we have is so show um, the second uh, catalog of uh, Cartier-Bresson's Carnet Mexicain, so images from Mexico. Um, this exhibition, so in uh, 95, uh, that's it, uh, was uh, focused on the 34, 35 images and also 64 because he went there back uh, at this moment. And we also wanted to show uh, you the, the um, um, it's downstairs too, the uh, cover of this uh, um, exhibition catalog of uh, Levitt's um, uh, Mexico City that has a very interesting essay by James Olds, uh, J. Olds, sorry, um, that is very uh, interesting. The very last thing would be how decisive uh, was this Mexican state for both, because you, you picked this title, uh, this decisive uh, Mexican um, uh, trip. Um, so, do you want to do or? Yeah, I think, you know, w for, for Levitt, um, I think it was um, very decisive. She finds herself there. Um, there's, in her first big retrospective um, at MoMA in 1943, uh, photographs of children, there's a whole section devoted to Mexico. And 15 photographs, I think? Something like yeah. that, yeah. Quite, quite a large percentage, um, relatively. She doesn't really return to um, exhibiting or publishing the Mexico City pictures. I think in the retrospective organized by San Francisco MoMA and um, the Met in 1991, only a handful of pictures yeah. from, from Mexico City. So after that, um, Levitt decides in 97 to publish an entire book on Mexico City. It was obvious that she had been thinking about these images and um, she wanted to, to uh, emphasize, give them an emphasis uh, uh, all her own. And uh, Hence the checklist. Yes, yes, in her archive there's a, there's a very kind of careful checklist of nicknames for the pictures. She'd been thinking about these and, and printing these over the, over the years. And um, I think that she found something of herself. I mean, we know also that before this trip to Mexico, even though she goes with, on the sort of coattails of uh, Alma Agee's uh, separation and eventual divorce from James Agee, she applies for a Guggenheim grant to photograph in Mexico. In Mexico in which she's still forming her s own self-identity as a photographer, she, and she's describing her goal as making pictures that are non-pictorial, non-documentary, non-objective, not sentimental, and not topical. Which leaves the question, what is there left to do? <laughs> 
but I think she finds a way. Thank you so much for this uh, in-depth uh, research on the relationship between Cartier-Bresson and Lewitt. That's really amazing. It opened a lot of uh, questions. Um, and I want to ask the audience uh, if there is anything that you would like to, um, to question or, or guess tonight and, and ask them maybe to come back on, on something that they, they say. Uh, if she wasn't making uh, contact sheets, uh, how was it choosing? Was she choosing her images? Uh, so, uh, as Anne mentioned, she Levitt does not develop the film from Mexico until after she gets back to New York. Um, uh, just like any of her work, she was making kind of small proof prints. Um, she had an enlarger, uh, uh, a lights enlarger. No, no, I think it didn't. But it's an enlarger that allows you to actually not cut your film. It's um, you can just slide the so film. So she was printing all uh, of the views. Um, early on, yes, yeah. Uh, I think she, she doesn't have other people print her work until I would say the. 1970s or so. So the, so the prints that were at MoMA in 1943, my guess, I don't know this for sure, is that she made them. Um, and so certainly she made the, the prints in Mexico, in Mexico City. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't know if that answer, answers your question. She, so she, you know, she, was, she had her own process that didn't involve contact sheets. Yeah. So, so in the archives, all the films exist as rolls? Most of the films are um, uncut rolls of film. Sometimes they're nitrate based mm. um, and wrapped up in uh, white paper with her text describing what key images are, are on that roll. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Any other questions? So I have one question. I would love to come back to the question of the um, of the political the political questions. Um, we know that both of them were uh, leftists, as you as you said. Uh, they probably met in a place which was the the photo league or related to the photo league, which was also an important place for uh, leftist uh, thinkers and photographers and. Um, I um, I've always thought that both of them were there for political reasons. I mean, you mentioned that. Uh, I think it's something which is super important for the two of them. They are also super involved with film, uh, as is Paul Strand. Um, and it's for me, it has always been super interesting to look at Cartier-Bresson and Strand to look at the, the film that Strand made in, in Mexico and to look at his photographs that are on the wall at the moment and to see the difference between the two. The, the, the film is clearly political, it's clearly a propaganda movie, there is no question about that. It was presented in life uh, when it came out as a propaganda uh, movie. Um, Cartier-Bresson was already um, starting to be interested in film when, when he was in, uh, in Mexico. Um, and then he learned how to make a movie and to translate his own political ideas into, into images. And so there is always this kind of discrepancy between the film, uh, the animated image, and the still image. Uh, the film is clearly political for Strand, for Cartier-Bresson, and also maybe in a way for, for Lewitt. Uh, and the, the still image is not clearly political. There is a kind of uh, political background, but it's not clearly political. So I, w I wanted to comment on that because Han, you, you spoke a lot about that, about uh, the people that are sleeping. Is it related to surrealism or is it related to a kind of uh, way of depicting poor people that are living in the street? And um, 
and I must say, and it's much more comment, but but I would love to hear your your thoughts on this on this comment. I I I I, I truly believe that um, uh, fo in, in in photography there is this kind of um, um, this kind of there is something floating, there is something there, but you cannot really put a word on it. Uh, it's something which is uh, always dialectical, always suspended. There is a, there is a kind of, um, there is a kind of meaning, but you cannot put clear words on this meaning. And maybe this is the reason why, personally, I love <laughs> photography because it's out of uh, something that you can explain through words. Cinema is not like that. There is a clear narrative in a in a film, or most of the time, uh, and so. I wanted to say that probably we, we cannot uh, explain why these photographs are political. They are clearly political, but we cannot explain uh, why, because there is this specificity of photography, which is a, a kind of unclear message or something like that. I'm, I completely agree with you. Um, I would just um, propose something that goes another way. That would be in two parts. Uh, first is the picture that is on the opposite side of the wall uh, by Strand, the blind woman, which is a single political image. Not only political, but it is political. And this one is. You cannot really uh, avoid that. But it's. I think it's not so common that uh, a single image has this power and has this um, clear message. Then the second part of, of uh, my, my um, hypothesis, maybe, is that um, one of the uh, ways for photographic images to be political more clearly is the um, sequence or portfolio. And I would bring up, of course, uh, Evans's Cuba's portfolio, because Evans wasn't, he would avoid being political at all costs. But his uh, uh, Cuba portfolio for a book that was, he, he pretended, he, he said he didn't read it, but anyway. Um, he went to Cuba during the revolution, so he, he couldn't avoid that. But um, his portfolio is political, but as a whole, some images, uh, some single images, including the ones he didn't take, but he brought into his portfolio, so anonymous or press images, were clearly political, but the portfolio is globally. And so one of the uh, possible ways for a uh, static image, a photographic image to be political would be to be um, arranged as a sequence, either in the press or in a book, as a portfolio. Any other questions? Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you for to both of you for for your uh, for your conversation. We are we are glad to have the the continuation of the the, the conversation that you had in the book. Thank you so much, uh, Josh, for coming uh, to Paris for this for this talk. That's really great to have you. And um, and yes, thank you so much. Merci. Thank you.